Okay, folks, here we go. Tuesday evening edition. And uh, let's get more fan going and let's see what we can get done. Now, uh, last Sunday morning, also known as a couple days ago, I was painting my Byzantine Spearman and I had to, I had to break off and do something. So this is where we've gotten. This is the front rank of the um, of an eight bow stand, and I will be putting them on the front rank. I'm pretty sure, because you can see their shields a little bit better. And uh, I'm going to try to push them as far back as I can on the stand. So we'll have the bowmen all the way in the back, and then we'll have these guys far enough that the tips will not protrude past the dimensions of the stand and make it a little bit more durable and uh, stands will mesh a little bit better but uh, I'm pretty happy with how that how that turned out it actually I think looks better than in the illustration because the painting style that I use leaves a little bit of black or darkness around each one and it, I think it makes that design pop it's kind of a little basic design but um, I'm happy with how it turned out. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to paint the other three designs on the shields this evening, hopefully, assuming I stay awake. Stayed up too late last night. Had too much fun playing DBA. And uh, we could talk about it if we get some people on here to interact with. And... Um, what we did and what the experience was and so forth, so. Okay. Let's make sure we got the magic liquids here. Definitely need that for this. I think this is really zoomed out, isn't it? It's zoomed in. Let me adjust that. Yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah, let's minimize this. Okay, let's see if, we, see if the magic liquids are in here. No. Nope. They evaporated. Hopefully we'll have somebody come on tonight. If not, probably won't be that successful. Now I should have these colors already out here. I do. And step one. Step one is paint all the other shields with the basic red, which is the same red that's on the back. So let's not grab one that's super. Let's take some of this stuff off, just for good measure. The thinner helps a lot to keep this paint to stick from sticking in the first place, but it will stick over time. much better. Now this pretty much takes all of the paint off. Stuff pricks pretty well now. If you can start getting a little bit of a, a curve in your brush, yeah, you're up a creek. You can't do anything with that. But 
It does a good job of getting all that stuff off of it. All right, here's the red, and here's an interesting thing that happens with this. It separates kind of like this, but in here we still got the, the good stuff. And, of course, black. I want to go fairly dark. Maybe even a little bit more than that. All right, we're just going to paint the back of these shields. And the front, too. Ah, who do we have here? Welcome. Stephen Gross, the Gross Man. Stephen the Great. Right? That's what that is in German. Grossa. Stephen the Great. I'm going to try to finish doing these guys uh, today. Turned out a lot better than I thought it was. I'm really, really happy with it. Considering this is a design that I was like, eh, I don't know, you know. Um, it made me want to paint more Byzantines. So that's good because I got a lot more Byzantine shields to paint. I have f four cavalry units that all have all will have the same shield on each one and uh, the cavalry commander that will have a mixture of things the commander will have his own thing and so will the other guy that's on there I think the flag bearer may have one as well so those may not all be the same way to, to be continued we will see but I'm always looking for excuses to paint shields. Always looking for excuses. You've been watching your paint over the past few weeks? And I was on vacation. You're retired, though. You're on permanent vacation. Aren't, aren't you retired? I hope you are. I wish I was. I got lots of painting to do. I, I should be retired. But then vacation may be, you know, you just go somewhere out of the, you know, your normal stomping grounds. I used to do I used to watch several people do this kind of thing and then I'm like well what better way than to do it myself and stay on track so I'm just like I don't even want to paint if I'm not on if I'm not live it's just too easy to just do it for 15 minutes and just say oh, I'm bored and then just go do something else so you guys are kind of babysitting me. <laughs> In a way. You've been retired for four years. Excellent. I heard about somebody recently. That they've been retired since they were 49. And they're, you know, so they've probably been retired like 20 years. But I ran into him at a show recently, and I'm like, how you doing? Oh, I can't have this, I can't have alcohol, I can't have tea, I can't have coffee, I can't... I'm like, holy shit. I don't want that to be me. I could, I could deal with not having any of those things, but why? You know? If 
That's why we didn't get on until now. I had to do some grocery shopping. I had to go to the gym. I don't want to be retired and in bad shape. Even though I'm probably a decade and a half from it. Oh well. I know lots of people. I know lots of people. Oh, I'm going to go to every war game show when I'm retired. And you never see them anymore because now they don't have money. Well, you probably didn't plan it right. I mean, war games, we talked about this last night. War gaming is cheap. I think it's a really cheap, cheap hobby. Now, you can, you know, go crazy and, you know, you can't go and, you know, buy every single thing you see. But, I mean, how much do these little bastards cost? And then how much time do they entertain you for? They're damn near free. But I'm not tempted to buy stuff anymore and not do anything with it. That's, uh, that's very unsatisfying. Very unsatisfying. All right, so we've got our basic color there that the entire shield is on. All right, now we're gonna do the rim. And I believe I mixed my own rim with the black and the white. So we'll do the same with that. So we're gonna outline the rim of the shield and then we'll go in and we'll put the little circles at the end in the yellow color, which we'll need more of and, uh, and work it that way. Cheryl and I went to Alaska. Got it off my bucket list. Was it um better than you expected? I uh, I don't know that I want to go. I'm not opposed to going, but. Land of extremes. You know, those last two states, Hawaii and Alaska, they're like polar opposites, aren't they? <laughs> polar opposites. I haven't been either one of them. It's just too difficult to take time off. And it's gotten worse because... Yesterday, I found out a guy I've worked with for, well, he's been there ever since I've been there. So he's been there, I think he was there like 33 years. And he was a young guy. I mean, he's a few years older than me, but I think it was 53, 54 or something like that. Had some massive heart attack and died. And it's a guy that I've always worked with. And it was just like, wow. And he's actually one of the guys that kind of kind of covers for me when I leave, so. Um, Doug Redshirt, am I going to Historicon this year? Yes, I've gone every year since 2006. I've gone every year that they've had it in July since 2006. So I went 2019, 20 didn't have one. Um, and last year, um, they wanted to put it in November. That's a deal breaker. I won't go in any shows in November. That's anniversary month. There's just too much stuff going on at that time. So July is in between the two conventions for us, and um, yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna run ten games up there. Mr. Doug, welcome back. Hadn't seen you in a while. Hope all's well. So, um, I'd say I would have gone last year if it was in July, but we're not going to go with restrictions. Mitch and I just, we, we don't, we're not, we don't need the game that badly. 
you know, we're driving 14 and a half hours one way. So, you know, if you make it too much of a pain in the ass, then, you know, if anybody doesn't need to game, it's us. <laughs> we game every week, you know, sometimes multiple times a week. But, um, yeah, we're planning on going. We're planning on going. It's That's going to be upon us in no time, isn't it? You know, the main reason I go to the shows is to interact with people. Um, it's for the social aspect. So I don't want to wear a mask in the social aspect. You can't understand anybody, you know. And, and I'm not a renegade. I'm not like, oh, okay, well, I don't care what the rules are. I'm going to do what I want. I'm, I'm not that guy, you know, so. But that's why I go for the social aspect. And not even for the shopping because, you know, I don't need anything, fortunately. Although, I am hopefully somebody is selling a Windsor Newton and Series 7 brush that I can take a look at and go, yeah, I'll buy one of those and then we'll, we'll try that. We'll try, uh, everybody, everybody raves about them. I, I'm skeptical. I don't think I'm going to be convinced. I don't think it's all that in the bag of chips. Um, we'll see. I'll throw $20 at it or something like that. Is that how much they are? Something like that. Um, I'm worth it. <laughs> I take good enough care of them. I mean, I've got the, this brush cleaner works great. I just want a brush that the end doesn't do a 90 degree turn after using it for a while. It's not even that, it's not even that close. It's not like it happens after using it a couple times. But yes, to answer your question, we do plan on going. We do plan on going. And unfortunately, it takes two days to get up there. <clears throat> because the problem is, if we leave at 5 in the morning, which is, which is a very reasonable time to leave. It's not like you're leaving at 2 in the morning or something. Um, that's just, leaving at 5 is just me waking up one hour earlier than I normally wake up anyways. Hit on the road, get the road, you know, hit the road. And the problem is, is Historicon's on the other side of both D.C. and Baltimore. And you hit both. If you leave at 5 in the morning from here, you hit the loop on both of those metropolitan areas exactly when everybody's leaving work. So that's a deal breaker. We can't do that. So um, what we normally do is we, go, we do something along the way, um, spend the night, and... Um, And let and um, and get in, go around both of those cities um, when they're at work. That's what we've done. Well, we didn't have to do it in Fredericksburg, but the last couple times that we went. Um, To Lancaster, what we did was we went to Gettysburg one year, and then we went to Fredericksburg. I think the last time. Now, it's okay. The problem is, is I really don't care about the American Civil War at all. I mean, I don't know that there's many wars I would care less about than the American Civil War. It was cool, but you know, not my thing. Yeah, terrain, paint, brushes would be higher on my list of figures. Yeah. I don't need to. I've gotten some good deals on flea markets, but. You know, I'm not looking for anything. But I remember I was going through a box one time. And it was a box. It wasn't even a big box. It was like, it was the size of this. It was a little box about the size of. Maybe half again as deep as about as, as this and it was just stuffed full of figures and I'm going through there and rummaging through and, and half of it is the excitement of you know seeing what could possibly be in there and I was looking for some knights for my Italian condotta when I was looking for those knights to build them and I'm just I'm just looking to see what's in here and he's like oh, 10 bucks for the whole thing and I'm like I'm just looking to see what's in here he's like oh, just take it for 10 bucks 
And I'm like, I start looking through there and I see elephant, elephant, other elephant, elephant, elephant. I'm like, yeah, I'll take it for 10 bucks. <laughs> I haven't done anything with it, but, you know, there was a bunch of elephants in there. So um, <laughs> I'm like, well, I got the beginnings of doing a Tamil army. And, um, you know, I'll still have to buy some figures that I'll like, but I won't have to get any elephants. But I had no intention to buying that. And then it's like, oh, well, you're, if you're going to just say something stupid just to get rid of them, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take them off your hands. But that's also why I have 100 pounds of 15 millimeter miniatures that I can't even pick up. It's, it's super heavy, but that's how it's happened, you know. And the new location is awesome. I think the new location is a civilized convention. I, I don't I don't know that I would go to Historicon again if it was held at the host. The host is just we work too hard to have to live with, you know, going to some place that looks like Stalingrad, you know? It was it was really, really bad the last time I went. Really, really bad. So looking forward to it. But unfortunately, I don't really have much of a time to play other games. So we just go and I do our DBA thing. We did change the schedule times. So there is a gap between games. You know, because... A lot of people like to give you like a two hour gap between six and eight, right? Well, the vendors close at six, so that doesn't do you any good for shopping. So, you know, we still did three sessions. We did nine to one, and then the next session doesn't start till 2.30. So you have time to get a bite to eat and then shop for an hour. Um, and generally, our games run less than the four hour session. So, you know, the whole point is don't rush people, you know? Um, some of us have jobs where we're rushed all the time, constantly, and we don't like it. Even though we're being paid well, we still don't like it. So I certainly don't want people having to do that for free, you know. So um, four hours is plenty of time to chit chat, move your stuff between tables, not be rushed, and finish all your games. And... Uh, and that's what we do here in Florida. We don't even try to run a fourth game. Just run three games. Uh, da -da -da -da. Was hoping to say hi to you there, but having to cancel due to mother's health. Maybe next year. Really enjoy your games. Good. Come by and that's the best thing you can do. That's the best thing you can do is just show, you know, We're all in it together. I appreciate you guys coming by and entertaining me. Uh, hey, in ancient warfare, the elephants could be used. Exactly. Really enjoy the new No Cave convention also. It is. Always been able to get a room in the convention center. We didn't get one last time. We, we, came, we went in and out. And I am an extremely early riser, so we didn't have a problem with parking. And we had a room reserved in 2020 and had to cancel it. So um, we've got one reserved this time. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you had a friend who went up for here, wish he had told me he was going up there, I meant. Yeah, it, it's, it's what a convention should look like. Um, it is, I mean, it's just, that's a really good location. You know, I thought Fredericksburg was really good too. It's closer for us, but you know, there's a lot of people that would, and we had it here in Florida, you know, when we had our show in Florida, it was always in Tampa. And um, the place that was being held out at Tampa, 
um, was really a dump. Um, it wasn't that the place was that bad. The rooms were bad. The convention center wasn't bad. It was like a comfort inn or something like that. They had like a convention center, but they had a lot of little breakaway rooms. The problem is, is you couldn't step outside because it was like a war zone of like homeless people and prostitutes. Um, but the actual convention wasn't bad. Well, they ended up like pay, knock, knocking the place down, so we had to find another home. So they put feelers out. And this was, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, something like that. And, um, you know, they basically settled on going to Orlando, which makes the most sense for a Florida convention. It's easy for people to travel out of town. There's lots of hotels with venues and stuff like that. And the people that had had the convention in Tampa, many of the people that had the convention in Tampa for many, many years were just obstinate about, we're not going to go to Orlando. So you've been sitting on your lily the whole time, not having to spend a room night, and now you're not willing after 10 years to go. and Because, I mean, we live an hour and a half or two hours from any of those, so we're always going to get a room. You know, and it's like, so you're never going to... You're going to complain about driving an hour or something like that? So that's the thing is, you know, if Fredericksburg was good for us because we didn't have to deal, we didn't have to deal with going around D.C. and Baltimore, okay? And, you know, yeah, it's another, I guess, three, three hours further or something like that. But, you know, people will complain like, well, I don't want to go to Fredericksburg because it's like a three-hour trip for me. I'm like... I guess you don't need a game that badly. And meanwhile, we're driving like 14 and a half hours. It's like, you know, go cry to somebody else because you don't get any traction from me. But then, you know, we don't do a ton of shows. I don't have other hobbies. I don't do sporting events or anything like that. So, you know, it's not like, well, I got to cut down on some of the 50 things I do. I don't do 50 other things. This is This is the only thing that I do, really. So, so yeah, we were going to plan on filming last night, and too many people showed up. We actually had seven players. We had seven players, and uh, we did an impromptu. We were going to do it. Uh, Marty came down, uh, or came up, actually, and he wanted to do an elephant theme with blind deployment. So he wanted to put, like, a screen up and, uh, and do that. That's, you know, he's traveling, so he gets to pick, you know. Um, he comes up like once a month or every other month or every six weeks or something like that. So we'll handpick what it, what it is. So an elephant theme had to have at least two elephants. And there were so many players, you know, you can't... If you have four players, it's still a long-ass session. And we had seven. So we're like, let's just all play on one big board. So we put up three boards. We set up the terrain normally. Um, you know, like the we had... Uh, three Indian players, because one player had classical Indian. The other one had, okay, Siamese. Uh, we had three players with Indian elephants from Southeast Asia. Okay. Siamese, classical Indian, and um, Tamil uh, on one side. And then uh, Mitch, uh, Marty, and myself all played a successor army. Uh, Marty played... Eumenes of Cardia, um, Mitch played Seleucus, and I played uh, Hucestus. And um, we just lined up, and um, it was just kind of impromptu what we did. It would have been cool to film it, but um, it, was just, it was just too much hubbub. Uh, both ACs were running, and it was hot as hell in there. There was kids coming in and out, a dog that was barking from time. It would have just... It was, it was, you know, very chaotic, but um, really three people is probably the best number. Four is okay, um, but any more than that, and people are just sitting around too much, and they're sitting around, and they're going to be talking, and there's a lot of background noise, and, you know, we're not going to say, hey, we're going to film, everybody shut the hell up, some people playing, that's not really the purpose, you know. Uh, you hated the host, got sick every time I game there, real 70s dive. Yeah, there was... Um, there was definitely some pollutants like uh, mold and stuff in the air conditioning for sure. Have you ever been to Nash Nashcon Nashville? I have not, um, and it's just too long a drive for for two days. 
Um, I was trying to get, I went to Siege of Augusta one time, and Siege of Augusta is Mid-South's um, area, just like Nashcon is. And I was trying to get together with the people up in Mid-South that play DBA. It's like, hey, why don't we just every year go to Siege of Augusta? But they like didn't want to drive there. You know, so I'm like, I went to Siege of Augusta one time. There was hardly any players, and it was a big expense for like a almost a six hour drive. It just didn't have value. And it's gonna cost me going to Historicon if I do that. So it's better not to do that one. So it's in the all right time of year, it's in January. Um, you know, January is a good month, you know, so. Um, but I did go one year, 2009, I think. But just didn't have value. So, you know, you give it a shot and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so we got the rims on these. I'm going to have to get a refill on something. Because I'm talking and I like to go through liquids. But it was so hot last night, I think I had four Cokes. And I didn't even get up to pee one time. That's how much I was sweating. It was just... And I, have, I sweat at my job a lot. So, Mitch works in a cooler. I work in and out outside. So, I do not like to sweat on my free time while I'm not being paid. While I'm not doing any yard work or something like that, you know. Like, there's no reason for that. All right, let me get a refill, and I'll be right back. Played a Napoleonic game at Fort Meade, Maryland in 92. Probably about 40 guys played. A lot of downtime as the game went on. Yeah, that's... We talked about that. We talked about that last night. And... Um, it's about having a good time and about being involved... So you have when you have, and we I talked about playing um, advanced squad leader. I used to play advanced squad leader quite a bit in the early '90s, and it's a lot easier set of rules to understand than many many other rule books because it's written really well. Avalon Hill stuff always was, and the problem isn't that something is complicated or it's just that that you have something to do and you feel involved. So when you have some kind of a system where it's like I'm going to attack you. And you and I and I'm gonna roll a die, and you also have something to roll. You have opposing roles. It keeps both people entertained. And one of the things that I talked about is like I would never, I would never play advanced squad leader anymore, um, because it's like okay, it's the prep fire phase. What's that mean? It means one guy makes all the decisions and attacks you, and you roll basically morale checks against it, and that's it. Um, and then the next phase is he does all the movement, and then and then 
and then you possibly could get a chance to shoot. It's too much like, um, tell me when you're done, I'll go make some coffee kind of thing. And that just gets people bored. Um, now, the ASL game that came out since then, which almost seems like it's it's a, almost a ripoff of ASL, but whatever. I'm who am I to judge? I'm just I'm just saying it looks very similar to it. Is um, um, I can never remember what the hell it's called. Um, I've got the video game of it. It's it's excellent because it's opposing roles, and it's one guy takes an action and the other guy then takes an action. And I have, it should be on my front here. It is called <sighs> Lock and Load. Lock and Load Tactical is a much better system, in my opinion, because both people are involved. And you need to keep people involved and stuff. Those big games are terrible because, you know, like, maybe you get to play some guy that comes in as a reinforcement on turn four. So after somebody explains all the rules the whole time, and you get through three games of playing... On turn four, you get to roll for the first time to see if you come in, and you throw and you screw up the roll, so you don't even get to come in at all. Your teammates are upset because you you don't get to roll. You know you you didn't come on the board. You're upset because it's like they've gotten to play for three turns and you haven't been there, done that, not doing it again. You know, took two days. Ain't it past my bedtime? Yes, but I have coffee. <laughs> I want to finish these shields, man. I'm on a roll. I didn't want to stop on Sunday, but I had to. I had to go. I had to go pick up the daughter from another city, so uh, I didn't know I had to do that. It just kind of happened. I'm like, okay, well, but I did get the one shield guy done. So, and then I thought I was gonna come back, and then we watched the dinosaur movie. So, the Jurass, your Jurass is parked. Um, and then yesterday was game night, so where are, where are my needles? <laughs> yes. I guess these don't count as needles because they're not hollow. Needles, I guess, have to be hollow to put that special stuff through it. Like I would know. Um, yeah, we talked about that last night, but no, we had a great time. It's a shame we couldn't film it because epic stuff happened. Epic stuff always happens, like unbelievable things, you know. Uh, we encountered new things, always, always encounter new things. Played the game 2,000 times, still encounter new things every time I play, just about every time. So few, so few people really know how to do convention games right. They do. Yeah, I think the way to do a convention game... Well, that's why I like DBA, okay? Not because I like Ancients. It's because you can just sit down and start rolling dice. Every, you, pretty much people know how to play. And you can just cut the crap and have a good time about what happens. Not... All right, let's get everybody together. Let's go over the set of rules that you don't know if they're going to be any good. You don't know if the people you're going to play with are people you don't want to be around for four or five hours. You know who they are. Um, I've seen other games. I'm like, man, it's a beautiful looking game, but I don't want to play with those guys. They're not having a good time. Um, and if you've seen any of our games, we have a fucking great time. It's almost illegal how much fun we have. Um <laughs> That's just, that's how I was, uh, that's how I was raised. Well, I don't know about that, but that's how I want, that's what I want out of it. And a lot of people just don't have a good time playing games. Um, but if I was going to play, you know, run something at a convention, uh, like if I was going to do my World War II skirmish game, you play everybody on one side. You just run, you know, you guys are going to run, you know, the Americans or whatever, and I'll run the Germans as the GM. Because then too much of the time is like, hey, let me go, let me ask you something. So you got to leave with one player, you know, and, and they ask you a question because they don't want the other side to just cut the crap, you know, just see if they'll like the game. 
And if they'll like it, then they'll play it again, and then they'll know the rules a little better next time. But, you know, trying to, to, to do, like, this, this, like, fog of war, it, it just, it's just too difficult, you know. So, and, um, and one of the things I was talking about, I was talking to Scott yesterday and before we got into our game, and he's is like, you know, I've just gotten to the point, I don't know where I've just gotten burned out on DBA. I don't want to learn new rule sets. That doesn't mean I don't want to play new rules. I just don't want to be the point man on them. Like, somebody asked me a question, hey, what about this? I've got to be the one that looks it up. And he's like, well, you're just lazy. And I'm like, no. The problem is, is that I... I'm kind of burnt out on it. And I also, um, I have to explain things to knuckleheads at work all the time, over and over and over again. And I'm kind of burned out on it. Um, and, um, yeah, so, um, and, and I'm not really good at explaining things. Um, maybe with an outline I'd do okay, but. Um, I just don't enjoy that. You got to know what your strengths and weaknesses are, and that one's not my strength. So, all right, we got to do four little circles so we can get these things in the right positioning. Um, here. So, all day long, for almost 30 years, I have to explain the same shit to knuckleheads every freaking day. And I just, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> do it anymore you know so I don't mind I don't mind playing new stuff but I, I just don't want to be the point man on it I don't want to be the point man on it so remember my friend telling me not to point when we were planning our moves, yeah. Yeah, you waste a lot of time there. Now, one of the best games I've ever played in my entire life is... One of the best face-to-face -face games I've ever played was an advanced squad leader game, Blind. So we had two sets of boards on two different rooms. I was playing against one other person. And, um, and there was a guy that was GMing it. And you never saw the other guy's counters. Like, you, you, you'd use the... If you played ASL or Squad Leader, you know what I'm talking about. You have those question mark things. So you'd put question marks out there. He would describe what is under the question mark. Like, you you know, you receive rifle or machine gun fire from here. Submachine gun fire. And it does this. Roll it. You know, he'd go between the two rooms. It was awesome. It was a shitload of work for the in-between guy. But it was a for great freaking game. Um, it'd almost be like playing that video game Close Combat um, against one other person. Um, but that would be good to do like in a team because then you could just talk amongst yourselves. Um, but that's one of the best games I've ever played. But it took, a, it, took a, it took a long time to play, which is okay as long as you're involved. As long as you're involved, then it's not boring. You just don't want to be bored. Now, in the last 10 years, yeah, it's probably was 10 years ago or something like that. I played a game for 10 and a half hours and I wasn't bored for a second. But I don't know if the other players were, but it was a multiplayer game. But there were just a lot of things to think about. Now, what did I do with this? Oh, I kind of blobbed them to towards the thing. All right, let's let's do that. I think we need more substance here. Here we go. So I really like that multiple. We were basically playing three games side by side. And we had to set up our own board, but once you once you were done setting up, you could go and help one guy or something like that. So it just so happened that 
we set up opposite from each other. Uh, so we, we were concentrating on one side and leaving one guy by himself. And the, on the other side, they did the same thing with the same guy. So it was these two guys were kind of fighting their own war. and We were kind of doing our own thing together. So that was kind of, that was pretty cool. But there wasn't any kind of like heavy pre-planning because I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of big battle when it comes to heavy pre-planning and like set up your commands and stuff like that. Because it's just, that's too reminiscent of doing a bunch of planning at work and then, oh, things change and then all the planning you did is wasted, you know. Australian Greg, just back from my coffee walk. Very brisk wind from the southwest has got up. I got back from game night last night about 11.20. It was 86 degrees. It felt like 86 degrees. I think it was like 82 or something like that. It felt like 86 degrees. It was like 84% humidity. It, you could cut it with a knife. It was miserable. It was miserable outside. It's worse than it's if it's hot. It was I can handle it being hot during the daytime, but hot nights, oh man, and the bugs and yeah. Not my favorite time of year here in the swamp. Let's see if we've got the, I think we need to do these other ones a little bit bigger. I should have done them all four at once, but I worry about stuff I shouldn't worry about sometimes. Like, well, let me just do one in case I don't like how it turns out. Not realizing, hey, dumbass, you're very capable of being able to fix it if you don't like how it turns out. Not, and it doesn't happen that often. One of the advantages of, of being experienced is you, you start seeing when things are going south a lot quicker than somebody who hasn't seen it before. So you can put a stop to whatever track you're on. You're like, mm, this isn't going to turn out. My end result isn't where I'm going to be there, you know, before you end up spending a lot of excess time on it. There seem to be a group of guys who really knew the rules. Now, I don't know if you played DBN, but the guys have started playing DBN here and using base widths, and the game is so much better when base widths. You know, instead of, um, well, instead of an inch, you basically, you know, instead of every everything being twenty in increments of twenty five millimeter, now they're increments of forty millimeter. Basically, so the game is infinitely better. Um, and um, I didn't get into playing Napoleonics when I was a kid because the, the group of people that were playing Napoleonics weren't ha here in town weren't having any fun. You know, like they're not they're not having any fun. They don't get excited enough when when people uh, when exciting things happen and um, they just weren't a lot of fun, you know. And that's why I never really got into the period. And now um, Mitch and Joel have all the Napoleonics that we all ever need. So there's no reason for me to um, to paint any of them, you know. Um, I don't need to dial get involved in, in that stuff anymore, you know. Um, I mean, the only reason I'd want to paint them is because that would get that would force me to read more about the period. Because wargaming is about learning for me. So, um, and participating in history, as I like to call it. So, to whatever level you can. I mean, I don't want. I don't want to do reenactments. I'm. I'm not interested in wearing wool anything. So. But that's why. That's why I consider. You know, you're able to participate in. You know, decision making. All right. We got a circle there. We got a circle here. We've got a circle. And the reason we're doing the circle is to make sure that the end. Gets to be put in the right place and rounded. But yeah, they played Napoleonics and just didn't seem like they were doing 
having any fun. So I never got into the period. I actually did have some. I had some Prussians from Battle Honors, I want to say. I had like two packs of Prussian infantry and a pack of guns or something like that. And I just never, just never did anything with them. I painted a few of the figures and just never did anything with them. So one thing I can say is I will get a lot of use out of these guys. So no fear of painting these and nothing happens with them. Bunch of Adler six mil one or base for DVN French and Austria. I think they would look good. Greg, do you live in Alaska? No, he lives in the other A place, Australia. I tell you what, if there are war gamers in Alaska, they're screwed. There's nobody for. Talk about a desolate place. That's got to be a desolate place for, for games. Now, I'll be honest with you. If something happened and I had to move from this town and I lost my Mitch, I think I'd be okay. Because there's at least this interaction you can have. Um, so, I'm not saying that I'm looking to move anything but that was that was a real concern for me maybe five years ago six years ago you know I don't because there was a there was a group there was a quite a long period of time where I didn't have anybody local to play like any historical miniatures and it sucked but even if I didn't have anybody locally to play as long as I got somebody to talk to about it. Or shit, we could do solo gaming or something. It'd be all right, you know. I just don't see not doing this stuff for the rest of my painting time. Now, it may be, you know, 15 years, 20 years from now, I'm like, I'm done with DBA 3.0. I want to play something else. We want to make our own system. I'm still going to use DBA army lists. I'm not going to throw away these hundreds of hours that I've put on just one army and just like, well, I can't use them again. Or, oh, i got to rebase them. It's like there's no point in creating other army lists because you're just, you're just inventing stuff as it is. All you're going to do is just take information that Phil Barker already put out there and did guess. And what are you going to do? Try to outguess him? Because that's all you're going to be doing as well. The information doesn't exist. I don't think we're going to learn anything new about, you know, the composition of the Parthian army or something like that in my lifetime. So, bringing my 2.2 PMR. All right. Post Mongol Russians. First job is refresh the bases that have a winter look. Once that is done, there's four elements to do crossbow, cav, two war wagons. Yeah. PMR. PMR, better than PBR. I, I don't know. I can't say that I've ever had that, but um, I can't imagine it's very good. Greg doesn't like Foster's, and Foster's has got to be much better than that, than a PBR. I mean, so many awesome things happen in the process of playing these games. I just can't imagine not playing them again. I mean, it, it just, it's epic. It's, it's 
epic stuff happens. Epic stuff happened last night, you know? Um, I had a situation where my knight general killed a unit in front of him and advanced and came in contact with the enemy fort and then had to fight the enemy fort. And I'm like, I know he's going to freaking die because I'm, I'm a four. Um, I'm a knight general four and there was a bow unit in there. So he's automatically an eight. You know, I'm like, man, I hope I get recalled from this. And, it just, you know, stuff, i played this game thousands of times and we still encounter stuff every, almost every single game we play that we haven't seen before. And, uh, you know, it's really hard for a game to get old when you keep encountering things like that. Is it perfect? No. But it's perfect enough for the time being where we can just, we can laugh, have a good time, start setting up the game, start rolling dice, and let crazy things happen. So, could it be better? Absolutely. It could be a lot worse. And... You know, it's hard to believe that we played this. I've played this same stupid game for almost 20 years. Uh, when will it be 20 years? Well, 18 years. It keeps me. I'm. It keeps me motivated to paint other stuff. So. Foster's is pig swill. What's PBR? Paps Blue Ribbon. It's old school American beer from, what is it, like the 40s or 30s or some shit like that? Talking about that last night. Scott couldn't believe I don't I don't really drink a game anymore with the guys. It's just too hot. You know, when we play in the evenings, last thing I need to do is be sleepy. And when I mean drink, I'm talking about even just having one drink. It's just I don't need it, you know. I need to drink at work. I don't need to drink when I'm doing my favorite thing. <laughs> nope. Drinking's not that important to me. I grew up wargaming as a kid. I didn't drink. Not that I would have a problem drinking, you know, I'm just saying it's not that important. Had a PBR in 1972. It's nasty. It was even an old beer in 1972. What's it taste like? Does it taste like Miller? I have no idea. I have no idea. All I know is the can needs a refresh on it. It looks it looks like something. It looks like welcome to Walmart. Beer's a pain in the ass because if you buy it and it's not cold enough, there's nothing you can do. You know, if you've got scotch or something like that, you know, you can always bring stuff with you to, you know, drop in there to cool it down. But you can't with a beer. I guess somebody out there probably puts ice in a beer, but I've never heard of that. 
That's that's a that's a bit extreme. That's a bit extreme. <laughs> okay, I think we're good with that. Now, what did I do next? I did the red and then do the yellow? I think so. I think I brought the red all the way up, so let's do that. Hey Tony, hard to actually see what they're paying. Everything ver uh, verbally, I have, and then people are rather interested in talking about other stuff. But we can do whatever you want. You tell me what you want to talk about, and then we can zoom in a little bit more. We can do that as well. We can do whatever you guys want to do. Let's see. Let's twist this around. Do, 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 do. Yeah, most people go on here don't aren't even painters. They just <laughs> just talk about shit. Hey, we can do whatever you want. Played a couple DBN games last year, then moved on to other set of rules. Yeah, if I was really into Napoleonics, I wouldn't play DBN. It would be like you know, if if you have a favorite period that is something you're really interested in, you're not gonna play something generic. Like I could never play Flames of War ever. I've played it. No, no, I'm a I am a tread head rivet counter when it comes to World War II stuff, uh, which is why I don't play World War II because you know nobody would put up with my detail, the detail that I would want. Um, I'm super anal retentive about that. Let's see. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna want them to look like this. This is the objective. Have to go now and get ready to take Lorraine to lunch for her 70th. Ooh. Wow. Big one. She's got a head start on me. I have a thing on my car that says my birthday's coming up. Not that it's really that big a deal. But it says, hey, your birthday's coming up on this day. I'm like, no shit. I know that. I don't need a reminder that you're mind. I mean, what kind of drugs do you need to do to forget when your birthday is? You know? <laughs> Last year was the first year I specifically went out of my way to not work on my work birthday. And I'm not going to do it again. I'm not working on my birthday again. Um, it falls on a Saturday this year, so I don't have to worry about that. But, yeah, I'm not working on my birthday again. It doesn't feel very... Yeah, I'm not even taking my own advice. I thought we were going to do red, damn it. Um... I'm not working on my birthday again. Those are pennies. I do. I don't use... I don't keep them on there. Um, this came from my 20s because I'm... I'm a devout... Well, I used to be. Devout 20 millimeter gamer. So here's some of my my Brits. Please disregard the shitty basing from the mid-90s that we didn't know any better. But they were on pennies. Um, and um, other than the basing... I think the quality, well, these guys are getting dusty. Yeah, maybe I need to put them somewhere. The quality of, wow, maybe you need to use a brush. It's not so hard. <sighs> the quality of the painting is just as good as anything I did now. This is actually some of the first ones I did the layering technique on. And um, let's put them over here where it's not blocked. But they were the permanent stand. And when I started doing 15s, I'm like, well, let's just glue them on here and then pop them off. Because it's really handy to have, be able to turn them around and get to all the nooks and crannies on them. And they're really cheap. I mean, there's no cheaper base than that. So, yeah. And finally have a use for pennies. You know? Following your sessions for months. Really want to become a better painter. I love your painting prow prowess. Yeah, well, I don't get discouraged. I, and there's lots of people that are that are wizards. Um, and it's just a trick. I'm not intimidated by that. I, I see stuff that is painted that I like better. I should put, let me word this correctly. That I like their, the way they painted their stuff better than me. And it's like, all right, I need to up my game some, you know. Because um, I hear people say all the time, like, I don't like seeing your painting it. It makes mine look like shit. And I'm thinking, well, that's not the whole point. The point isn't for me to 
make myself look better than other people. This is I do this because it keeps me on track. Otherwise, I'd be doing something else. So this forces me to not be able to like quit after 15 minutes because I'm not going to let you guys all hang. You know, I'm not, if I'm falling asleep, it's different. Um, but you know, this keeps this keeps me on track to get something accomplished. Um, it's not to hey let's let me pat myself on the back. Um, as a painter, you don't really I don't really care about other people's opinion whether they like my stuff. I don't and I don't want that to sound harsh, but you need to be you need to be happy with how you do because you're the one that's going to get burned out. So I see other people's stuff that I like better and I know it's a trick and it just I think my painting has improved a lot because of the internet because we can now see exchange information and exchange techniques and stuff. Nobody's got all the answers, you know. Um, when I started not using, um, let's move this over here, some, there we go. Uh, when I started using the tufts, I think that my basing improved a lot. Well, how did I know to use the tufts? I saw someone using them, you know. And then I'm like, all right, I like how that looks. And, um, you know, learn from each other. I think we could bring the red all the way up. I don't think we need to hop between them. I, I like painting one guy all the way through. I don't like putting a figure down and picking another one up. It's It feels flimsy-ish. And some people paint guys on popsicle sticks. Hey, if that works for you, cool. Does It does not work for me. I need really short-term goals and sh and to see something completed. I've painted Romans before in big groupings like that. So the first day, you have nothing to show for it. The next day, you have nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it. And then one day, two weeks down the road, you know, the whole, they're all complete. Well, the problem is, is I've fallen off the wagon and gone and, you know, lost interest in painting it um, before that, by that time. So that, that system doesn't really work for me. Um, the best thing I can do to speed things up is to... In other words, speed things up from the standpoint of get more things painted. It just paint more frequently. Uh, everybody that I've seen that I like their painting better than me paints just as slow as I do. You know, there's no quick fix, you know, something like that, you know. So, other people paint faster than me? Absolutely. But... I'm going to try to do as good a job as I can because that's satisfying. Been a wargamer since 78 and struggling painter concurrently. My painting has improved a lot. I still take a long time. You paint in groups of 10. I always considered my fellow gamers critique of my painting skills as part of gamesmanship in general. I started painting in 85. So you're probably... And you're probably 10 years older than I am. Most of my viewers are 10 years older than me. They're in the 60s. And I'm, I'll am i be 51 in a few days. Don't feel like it. I feel like a 25-year-old with 26 years of bullshit that I'm not going to put up with anymore. I do want to get the Byzantines done. I'm ready to work on something else. And the funny thing is, I, I love getting an army done, but I have almost no interest in playing it. <laughs> that sounds strange, but, you know, playing an army, what could happen? Well, they could have start having a bad, tr they could have a bad uh, win record, you know, and that would be, dis that would be disappointing. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like I'm a foodie too. Like I'll be at a restaurant and I'll like be eating food A at that restaurant and I'll be talking in the future about other meals. Like, you ever been there? You ever been with, you know, go out with other people and you're always talking about food? 
you're eating one food and talking about what your next meal is going to be. You know, that's... I'm kind of that way with, you know, armies. I, I don't really... I'm not excited about the army I'm doing right now. I want to be excited about the next one I'm going to do. I don't know. Maybe everybody just kind of does that to, to the same... To some degree or another, but... I think I'm going to do successors next or bring my Ptolemaics up to 3.0 and then expand. But I'm not making any generic successor armies, okay? I'm not going to make like, you know, eight pikemen that I can use for, you know, Antigonus or Seleucus or whoever. Now, I'm going to make Antigonus pikemen. I'm going to make, that's the whole, I'm a painter. You know, I want to make, make, I have to make some kind of a judgment call to make them all look a little different. And, uh, and I appreciate that um, that's part of the fun for me, you know. So, like, you, would, you wouldn't catch me dead doing a generic medieval army. Absolutely not. I want a French one, and I want an English one. I want a Spanish one, and I want a, you know, German one. And, and they don't, you know, you can't, well, we'll just use all these knights and... Now, if we're playing a pickup game or some historical battle where I need to fudge troops, sure, but I'm not going to not paint knights and you just make generic ones. But hey, you know, at the same token, if that works for you, hey, do that. But I, that's that's not what I would do. I would, I'm going to make guys that are specific for certain things. So actually look forward to to doing that one of the other thing I would like to do at some point is at Historicon in like 2007 I think it was 2007 we played a huge game with like 12 or 14 players all on a big board I mean so the map was probably like I don't know 10 by 12 or 10 by 16 or something like that a huge table it was one big tablecloth, and it was all like Western Europe, and it was stylized. There was like clumps of woods in different places, and there were cities in certain places. And so imagine like if everybody was playing on a map of, you know, between Gaul and, and, um, and Dalmatia. And, uh, and it wasn't super detailed, like, you know, specifically, but it was generic, like... There was woods where the black forest would be and coastlines and stuff like that. And then everybody took on uh, the role of their own army. Um, and it was like a fall of Rome type thing. And it was like the most freaking awesome game I've ever played. Um, and I want to recreate that, you know, where you're running your own 12 elements. So maybe one guy's running the Franks and the other guy's running the Huns and somebody else has the Ostrogoths. And, and you would get... Your scoring would be in the form of plastic gold coins that you would get from, you know, killing a ge an enemy general or a certain amount of units. Or uh, if you sacked a city, you would get them. And then, you know, that was your scoring mechanism. And it was a lot of fun because, um, you know, you could help other people out and just, you know, that kind of stuff. You're 65. Yeah, you're just a little bit ahead of me. Was there a game on Monday? There was, but I couldn't film it. What 3.0 Norman army is the one you're painting? I have 15mm Normans, still need to paint. Um, well, they're mercenaries in the Constantinian Byzantine army. So this is the Byzantine army that got devastated at Manzikert. So between um, Basil the uh, Bulgar Slayer and um, and the Comnian Byzantine, there was um, there was a dynasty that, or actually a couple different dynasties that really did not want to spend a lot of money on the military, and it cost them badly in the form of getting their ass beat in battles. They had troubles with the Normans in Italy. And they had problems with the Seljuk Turks. And, uh, and they relied on a lot of mercenaries. And that's what this army is. 
And the reason I decided to do this army is they can have a command post for the general. It's actually the emperor with his, with his guard. That was the reason to do that. And a lot of the common troops look very similar to where they would look like in the Komnenin list as well. So I'm building this army and then I'm going to build a few other elements to update the next two Komnenin lists. So I'll have, by the time I'm done, I'll have three armies. Um, so the Normans are mercenary troops inside this, this army. So chocolate coins. Ooh, that would be a mess. That would be a mess. So, um, yeah, so this army, I think, is like from like 1042 to uh, 1074 or something, 1075, something like that. Um, so that's the first Normans I've painted as Normans. I had some of them in my feudal Spanish army, um, Norman figures, but they're really old school Norman figures. And I get a kick out of painting these figures that people don't go after and they're not highly sought after that are second tier figures because I have a lot of them because nobody wants them so they've literally been given to me or I've gotten really good deals on them on a flea market um, and I kind of enjoy painting figures that that with a little bit of love um, shine as bright as any other figures. Um, to put it lightly, I guess that's kind of just what's happened. And um, anyhow, so yeah, that's what the Normans came from. Unfortunately, some of those Norman figures didn't give me a whole lot of space to put like serpents and stuff. I wanted to. Um, but the Norman army is an army that Mitch already has one of. And um, didn't necessarily keep me from building them. But, you know, it is a team effort. I mean, you might as well work on something that he doesn't have. And we don't have any Byzantines, so, you know. The thing about DBA is cool variety of armies. It's less Eurocentric than DBN. Uh, the Normans are used to be called tabletop games and are now carried by alternative armies. Alas, must get back to work. Catch you on the weekend. You will not, because we are going out of town for Father's Day and birthday and all that stuff. So we go from one extreme to the other. I painted every day last weekend, and I will not be here Friday night, Saturday night, or Sunday night, or Monday. We're traveling on Friday, and we'll come back sometime... Uh, there might be painting Monday night, but I wouldn't bank on it. So my gaming will be on Tuesday, if there is any next week. So Yeah, that's just one of the things, one extreme to the other. Summers are really, really busy for us. Really, really busy. Some people are like, oh, I don't have a lot any time in December. December's actually all right. I mean, there's stuff you got to do in December, but... Summers, there's just a lot going on. Everybody in the house's birthdays in the summer. You got Mother's Day, Father's Day, Fourth of July, Memorial Day. There's just a lot of non-gaming type stuff to do that, you know, I don't really regret it. It's just, you know, the fact that that's just the time when everything seems to be happening. Some people always say, oh, I, don't want, I don't want a convention to happen in January. I don't have any money. And I'm like, well, January, there's really nothing going on other than if you want to go to theme parks like we like to do, the weather is like, that's when you want to go. The weather's perfect in, in January. You don't want to go in the summer. But usually in the summer, there's way too many things to do. Yeah, no paint this weekend. No paint this weekend. Da -da 
the, the Normans fought each other a lot. They did. They did. And they had incredible effects in battles um, way out of line with the numbers of folks that were in them. Seljuk Turks destroyed my Crusader army once. Too many horse archers. Yeah. Yeah, the Normans had had like 300 knights and they would just do things really at the really disproportionate to the number of guys that were in there. So All right, let's bring the yellow up to snuff to where it needs to be. Should still have some of this. Mitch has a Norman army, so I don't need to build the whole Norman army, which is a shame. I'd, I'd love to build, uh, well, his, I don't know what his is set up for, but I'd love to build old Bobby Giscard and company. When I do them, I'll probably just make them Sicilian Romans. It's a much lighter army because it's half, it's basically half Muslim. So they have a lot of skirmishers. According to DBA, according to the, the great Barker. I'm working on a, you just bought my favorite book on ancients. Which one? Oh, Nordic. There you are. Uh, you mean you bought, um, Warfare in the Classical World? It's a great book. You probably got a good deal on it, too. Currently working on a project for a campaign during the old Saxon heptocry, including Welsh and Irish. Ducks, Brit rules. The Varangian guards were Norman. Some of them. Some of them were Anglo-Saxons, too. This car would be fun. Yeah, that guy was a... That guy was something. That guy was something. Larger than life. Warfare in the Classical World. Great book. Great book. A really good... I'd say a beginner book without it, without it sounding like it's a shitty basic book. It's just done really well. I mean, there's text. There's freaking diagrams that make sense, that look nice. There's artwork that's beautiful. Uh, you know, it's dated. I mean, it's, shit, it's probably 40 years old, maybe 50 years old, some of the artwork. Doesn't matter. Looks great. You know, nobody complains. Oh, man, Angus McBride, man, he painted some of this stuff a long time ago. Nobody complains about Angus McBride. Everybody likes his shit. He was awesome, you know? Um... You got it under $5 in good condition. I'm going with early Roman Republic versus Etruscan, Sam Knights, and leading into the Punic and Pyrrhic Wars. That's my boy, Pyrrhus. Yep. My boy, Pyrrhus. Yeah, I'm still reading about the successors. I'm doing a uh, a audible book, the second one now. I'm getting a real good grasp of who's who. Um, you know, some subject matter is just really complicated until you like really kind of dissect it. I think the Napoleonic Wars would probably be the same way if I was to sit there and dissect that as well. You know, on the outside, it seems really 
complex like you know well wait a second why did these guys sign a peace treaty or when did this battle happen or whatever i mean you know and i i have i have more i have better knowledge of most military history stuff than people off the street not necessarily you guys you guys aren't off the street i'm talking about people off the street because you know even if i wasn't a war gamer i still took electives for all of my i took history for all my electives in college you know so that's what I wanted to do. I mean, that's even though it was a period I wasn't even going to war game. That's what I'm interested in. So, um, but um, getting a real good concept of who's who, who's on what side. You know, obviously, sides change and stuff like that. Still haven't found a famous favorite successor other than uh, you know. No, we're not counting Pyrrhus. He wasn't around. He wasn't around the same time that Alexander was. Did I end up watching Revenant? Yes. Uh, my mom liked it more than I did. It's one of those movies. It's a movie like... A couple things about Revenant. Um... I thought it was supposed to take in a later period of time, take take place in a later period of time. What's well, like eighteen twenties or eighteen thirties? Um, it was good to watch once, and it, it's it was like uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks. I don't want to see Castaway ever again. Um, it's like there's some movies you should only watch one time. Um, it was beautiful, um, and. Um, one thing that struck me and I hadn't really experienced this. I haven't seen him in a ton of films, but Tom Hardy is a very versatile actor because I think he did a great job with that. I was at first I'm like, I know he's in this movie. Which guy is he? And then it hit me, it's like, oh, he's that guy? Oh man, he really changed himself into somebody else. So, and that's what I think you need to do as an actor. Um, yeah, uh, Imperial Romans are for the order, order battle sixty nine battles of three emperors. Cool, Romans versus Normans. And Romans excuse to field some Praetorian figure units. Yeah, though those guys were bastards, weren't they? <laughs> those guys were total bastards. You dated my history professor's daughter during undergrad senior year. Had to do well in that class. <laughs> yeah. I hated American history. Hated it. I don't like American history. There's just much cooler things everywhere else in the world. You know, it's like we don't have enough interesting characters here, so we got to learn about laws. I don't want to learn about laws. Screw that. That's boring. I'm not going to be a lawyer. Pardon my ignorance, but who defeated the Byzantines at Manzikert? The Seljuk Turks did. You lost your volleyball name, Wilson. <laughs> That's right. It's not ignorant. It's just you don't know about that period. It's not your thing. I wouldn't have known about it. I mean, I didn't play, I didn't play anything ancient or medieval until 2004. I wasn't against it. I just didn't. The Seljuk Turks. Yeah, captured the emperor and everything. So the emperor got captured. The Byzantine history is just insane. I'd say they'd need to make a movie series on it, but they'd just screw it up. And they would just invent crap that wasn't true. Which is like, just tell people the story. There's enough interesting things on there. But um, the... There was an emperor before the guy that was captured at uh, Manzikert, whose name is Romanos IV Diogenes. And there's a couple of different ruling families that ended up being emperors and stuff like that. And, um, and they would take turns kind of like, you know, swapping around who it was going to be. And um, 20 or 30 years before this guy got on the throne... There was, a, there was a couple of empresses that really did not want to give up control at all. And they were kind of behind the scenes, kind of in charge of a lot of the stuff. And this, this guy ended up getting, was one of the, 
was a general of one of the armies, Romanos IV. And, uh, and he wasn't necessarily a bad general, but um, he ended up getting picked. The, the, the empress remarried him and, you know, by default made him, made him the emperor. But anyway, so he goes on campaign and stuff. And, um, and basically he gets um, one of the guys that's running a third of the army uh, is from one of the other families that wants to be in control and basically bails on him at the wrong time and the emperor gets captured everything and uh and the turks actually um treat him pretty well from the standpoint that they they let him ran get ransomed because a lot of these guys you know they the people on the bottom of the tier just basically get treated like crap but most most of the time, a lot of the people of, of the leaders of both sides, they're pretty reasonable with them. So they let him be ran ransomed. And, um, and if I get some of these details wrong, uh, don't crucify me because, you know, I, I did re read this a few months ago. But it's very interesting because there's a lot of, like, um, backstabbing and deals and stuff like that done with each other. But basically, the emperor gets, you know, he gets defeated in this battle because, you know, a third of his army basically leaves. Uh, he gets surrounded. He gets captured. Uh, he gets ransomed, um, and then he goes back. And um, the other family basically hold a coup and take the control back over for him. And uh, one of the things that the the Byzantines like to do to each other is they like to um, they like to uh, damage, but that's not what it is. They like to mangle the peoples either by you know you basically can't be emperor if you know if they if your nose gets cut off or if you get blinded so they like to do that kind of stuff so they they capture this guy they hold a coup uh and the old emperor you know even though he lost the battle and uh he got he was allowed to be ransomed back um he ends up getting blinded by the other guys and the blinding goes bad and he dies a very painful death by um by blinded, being blinded very poorly. So it's extremely interesting. Um, it's very interesting, the, the backstabbings and the, the manipulating that goes behind the scenes. Um, a lot of the Byzantine history is really similar to, well, I would imagine a lot of other countries where it's like, you know, even if they didn't have any enemies they were surrounded on all sides by, they still have such problems just from infighting. Uh, and the Persians had the same problem when they were fighting uh, uh, the, um, the Greeks and stuff like that. They would have, you know, uprisings and, you know, one guy would take over, but there's like three, there's like basically four brothers. So they, there can only be one and they all murder each other. And it's, you know, really, really interesting and, and convoluted. I know who the first enemy general of Rome I'm going to build an army for. Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. Well, the Superbus is just a cool freaking name. He has the best name. Yeah, Superbus is... Yeah. Um, my, um, my fake Roman name that I like to use is I like to use Antonius Maximus. But, uh, you know, been practicing law for 40 years in Virginia, Richmond. Oh, well, we can't be friends then. <laughs> What was then they lost Constantinople? So, um, the big nail in the coffin that happened to them is in the Third Crusade. God, where do I begin? Um, in 1204, I think is what it was, they launch a, they launch a crusade that... Um, that the Venetians and the Venetians are like massive backstabbers. They'll basically do anything for a coin. Um, and um, they basically launch this expedition that the Byzantine emperor at the time says he's going to pay for. And then he can't come up with the money. And they basically said, well, we're just going to freaking pillage Constantinople. And they took over Constantinople for about 60 years. And that was really the nail in the coffin of, 
of uh, Constantinople because they had they had high points and they had low points, and you know there was many times that the Byzantines from 500 A.D. through 700 A.D. really got pushed back to basically almost getting taken over. Um, first from the Sassanid Persians. Um, they, um, they were doing well. Uh, the Byzantines were actually doing well. They had a guy named, um, you know, obviously Belisarius and Justinian. They, they recaptured a lot of territory when the, when the West fell. They captured a lot of territory. And that was in the mid-500s. But then there was plague and this kind of stuff, you know, happened. And, and then you had some weak rulers. And then you had a guy that kind of reformed the army named Maurice, who was kind of a really formative guy to kind of try to get the power back again. And this was like in the late 500s, early 600s. But apparently he was really frugal, and uh, the army didn't. One of the commanders didn't like that, so he basically uh, murdered him, and um, and basically sent the whole empire into a, ba a tailspin. This guy named Focus, and um, and the and the Sassanid Persians used the excuse of, oh well, we're going to attack because you know they had had some. 40 year truce or something like that going on with them. And it's like, well, we're going to attack now because we, you, we want to dishonor, you know, that guy was dishonored. So they took the advantage and they pushed basically the, the Byzantines all the way. They took over all of Egypt um, and, uh, and all of, all of their possessions in Asia Minor, almost all the way back. And there was a guy named, they had to bring another general up named Heraclius who ended up taking over. And he was, he was like the provincial general in, or the provincial uh, governor in Egypt at the time, and he basically said, you know, oh well, you're if you're going to attack Constantinople, well, screw you, I'm going right after your capital. And he basically did an end around on, um, on the Sassanid capital, and was successful, and like it was like a bad omen for the. Um, the king of kings of Persia, he ended up getting taken out by his own people. Just, just crazy stuff. So Heraclius was kind of all on the up and up. He kind of, you know, they were had their backs up against the wall and he brought them back. And then, of course, what happened from that is you had the the rise of um, of the Muslims. And that really, the, the Persians and the Byzantines had weakened themselves so much over... 250 years of fighting um, that they basically the Muslim invasion took out the Sassanid Persians and really crippled the Byzantines bad so the Byzantines were on the up and up Persian uh, the Muslim invasion came in took out the Persians and basically put the 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 Byzantines all the way back on their um, on their gates and that happened a couple times in the 600s and 700s to them. I think in like 707 or 713, they literally had Constantinople surrounded, but they were able to hold on. And then they were kind of playing a defensive war for a couple hundred years. And there's a couple of dynasties that really kind of made big comebacks. In the in the nine hundreds, late nine hundreds, and the early thousands, and then this guy came in to kind of squander it all away. Uh, the Com the Comnenians came back, kind of did a little resurgence, and then after the end of the Comnenians, they had the you had the uh, Constantinople got taken by the Crusaders with uh, Venetian help, and that was just kind of the nail in the coffin. They never really recovered after that. They did. You know, there was a bunch of separate crusaders. States, just really convoluted stuff. But it's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. Um, really fascinating stuff. So if you're really interested, you know, the, the, the secret with doing something like that is you got to find a book. Like, I, I love Audible stuff. Find something that's kind of not too focused because you could just get lost in the details. You kind of have to, 
You know, it's like if you don't know anything about World War II, you don't go and start reading something really focused. You kind of have to work your way from something larger down so you can kind of understand, you know, what's going on. And there's lots of great stuff out there with on YouTube with kings and generals and all kinds of stuff that just kind of be able to wrap your head around it. But the Byzantine history is just insane, just insane stuff. You know, there's they had a Byzantine emperor uh, in the late 600s, uh, Justinian II, who basically, um, he got ousted and they cut his nose off and they sent him off. I mean, that was the thing that they, they literally basically defaced him. So he wasn't allowed to be emperor or whatever. And um, he came back. He came back uh, a couple decades later and he was going to pay folks back for all the injustices that got done to him, supposedly. But uh, so there's all kinds of really insane stuff that happened with those guys. And there was just so much infighting. It's like you didn't even need enemies with that much infighting. But really, really interesting stuff. And they had that whole controversy. The Byzantines had that whole controversy called iconoclasm. And it's basically almost like uh, the, the Calvinists versus the Catholics. Just to kind of put it in really general terms, you know, you had, um, uh, you know, the Byzantine art and stuff has always been very, well, I always thought it was very icon based, like, you know, crucifix and, and specific paintings of saints. And I love all that art. It's very beautiful. But they went to the extreme to the point where, you know, they would, they would want to kiss different things and almost treat them almost like little minor gods. So they had kind of this, you know, Calvinist kind of uprising called iconoclasm where they like burned all these things down and, you know, they destroyed all of these uh, religious things. This is while they're, you know, trying to fight the, 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 the Muslim invaders as well. And um, it's just, you know, you'd have one emperor that was in favor of it. And, and then, you know, there would be uprisings and some other guy would come and he'd bring his stuff back. And, you know, it eventually fizzled out and they kind of, they, they didn't go the, the Calvinist way. But they were, it wasn't so much of like, you know, just art, but they were almost like venerating it, you know, to, to an extreme. It was, um, it was pretty crazy. So, but there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of crazy shit. So... Yeah, back when the History Channel was a History Channel. We used to call it the Hitler Channel because there was so much Hitler stuff on there. I would love to visit the Hagia Sophia at least once. Lovely, lovely, holy place. I don't think I want to go to Turkey. I don't think I want to go to Turkey. Marathons of Middle Age History, yeah. I think a lot of those places, when you go to them, you have this idea that they're going—they're a lot bigger than they are. I'm not saying it's a small place, but it's so difficult and so much of a pain in the ass to go to Europe. Forget the cost. I mean, there's a cost aspect too, and lots of days off. I, I don't know. I don't know whenever. I don't know when the hell I'm ever going to get a chance to go to Europe. But I'm not so worried about it because. You got Google Mobile, man. Just get on the Google Mobile and just go down the road. You can see what's going on, you know? we doing oh we got a ways to go what time is it Oof. we're not going to be done with the shields tonight that's okay we're working towards a common goal we'll get there eventually we got one more highlight to do on the red we don't do that until the yellow is all the way up where it needs to be 
and then the rim. And the Roman history, of course, is crazy. I see you're doing the early Romans, so it's all Republic. That's what I think of. I think of the Romans as Republic, Republic guys. Uh, Turkey, not nice. They will not let Sweden and Finland join the... Oh, really? Is that what's going on? I don't, I don't pay attention to news. Turkey and join Russia and the Mickey Mouse Club. Is that war still going on? Police action, whatever they want to call it. I was watching it. I was watching it at the beginning until that Snake Island thing happened. You know, all those guys that supposedly surrendered. And three days later, you know, and they were like, oh, and they mowed them down. Because they basically gave them a bastone, like, nuts, we're not going to surrender. And then like three or four days later, it's like, oh, no, they didn't mow them down. They captured them. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not interested in. Is this my Historicon army? I'm planning on using it quite a bit. You like Republican history or Imperial history? The problem with Imperial history is this. Most emperors, most Roman emperors were really messed up individuals that had complete control, for the most part, well, until they got murdered, over the situation. Um, and if you had a general or a senator that sucked, the whole, it didn't take over the whole psyche of the whole nation. I don't know, there's just not that many emperors that are, that are interesting. I mean, how many emperors are interesting? Trajan. Who else? Well... You know, the later ones with the crisis of the third century. But I'm not really... That's Now you're getting really, really diluted. Um, you know, so... Did you, tell me, did you tell me you had or hadn't seen the Rome miniseries? You got to see it. It's awesome. It's, it's pretty freaking good. There's something there for everybody. I got to see it at the time when I was painting my Romans for the first time. So between that and that podcast, the History of Rome podcast, yeah, I was all up in it, man. I, I feel like I, I had a really good understanding of everything that was going on. And it's funny because I really don't like politics at all. And the Republic stuff is more, po more political than anything else. Claudius series when it came out. I have never seen that. I, I haven't avoided it. I just haven't seen it. Hadrian. Vespasians and his sons. Not much damage can be done in a short period of time. I've indeed seen Rome. I have it on DVD. Julius Caesar. Hold my beer. I'm not a Julius Caesar fan. That doesn't mean he wasn't good at what he did. I'm just not a fan of his. You know? Marco, there he is. Marco, you have a fa you have a favorite. Uh, oh, hold on! Somebody told me how to needed to pronounce this. The a tho, the 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 a ah diadaki. Fuck it. <laughs> I saw somebody's article on it. And it's like you don't need to pronounce 
you can you need to pronounce Greek things correctly if you're speaking Greek. I'm not. I don't even pronounce my last name correctly when I'm speaking to people in English. So there's my out. I need to say that correctly. You guys don't know how to roll your R's, so I can't say my last name correctly. Uh, I actually want to build Caesar's Legion in Gaul. Some overall goals go from 509 Chronicles of Britain for Roman stuff. Strongly considering abandoning my early Byzantines. <gasps> What would uh, what would Belisarius say? I hate Justinian. Justinian is such a freaking dick. <laughs> I don't care what he built. He did freaking Belisarius wrong. And Belisarius put up with it. He's a better man than me. I would have freaking run a run a coup. And he wasn't a military commander. He was like a freaking... Uh, Justinian was like a freaking nerd burglar. Like, I want a guy who's a military freaking commander. Well, it's with a G. So, no, it's Spanish. Definitely. It's America, damn it. <laughs> is it. Is it still America? <laughs> I'm starting with the very early Republic just after Superbus was thrown out as a king. Yeah. Justinian and his whore wife. Oh. <laughs> I don't care about that. I just, he freaking did Belisarius wrong. You know who he reminds me of? He reminds me of, if you guys have seen, have you, which is, this is worth watching. If you've seen that series called Versailles, um, and it's about Louis the Fourteenth, and um, the guy that plays Louis the Fourteenth is the guy from Vikings that plays the monk, Althasan, or whatever his name is, and he does an excellent job. Although, he could have at least faked a little bit of a freaking French accent, like, you know. Um, anyhow, um... Justinian hits me like Louis the Fourteenth, you know. Basically, like, no matter how much you kiss up to somebody, it's not good enough, and he's just gonna, you know, he's gonna just keep you down, you know. He's just gonna keep you down and just treat you like a cry nerd burglar. Yeah, that's my, that's one of my sayings. Yep, biggest dick, dick, dictus. Uh, you're a legend, Nordic or a maelstrom, as it were. Throwing Theodore under the bus, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> she had it out for freaking Belisarius. Screw her. And so did... Uh, she was buddies with uh, Belisarius' wife that also did him, did him wrong. I'm surprised he put up with that shit. Oh, man. <laughs> Justinian had at least had a code. I don't know. Had all those damn Huns in his army, too. The damn Huns. I'll get to do them sometime.
guys that eat raw meat, right? They throw their, they ride on their meat. <laughs> I think I read one time they would like cut thing, you know, they would they would like throw it on their saddle and they would like ride on it and then like eat it later or some shit like that. I don't know. I'll do them before the Mongols though, because I think they're a little bit more interesting to. Could do more, you know, fall of Rome stuff would be a little bit more interesting than, you know, Mongol thing. I think she was buddies with everybody. How's that old how's that old joke go? What's the difference between a bitch and a whore? A whore will do anybody, a bitch will do anybody but except you. I think that's how that saying goes. <laughs> Sayings from the 20th century. <laughs> Bitch will do anybody but you. Watch football since I found out the refs are allowed to gamble on the games. Huh, didn't know about that. I don't watch football because football players don't watch wargaming. Screw those guys. That, and if I wanted to see people kneel, I'd go to church. That's what I say. Uh, unfortunately for the Byzantine Justinian's empire was lost and the Arabs exploded a generation later. Yep. Yeah, Maurice got screwed too by freaking focus. Yep. All right, Doug, good night. Thanks for coming by. Because Maurice wrote a whole treatise on uh, military manual and everything. He didn't care. Got rid of him. Apparently, he was really frugal. bring gladiatorial combat don't tell me you guys wouldn't watch that I would I mean you know you get to use like the trident and shit like that hey don't put anybody put bad people on there That's how Survivor should be. That's how Survivor should have been. You know? Hidden cameras. An island. We come back in a week. There can only be one. If there's three of you left, we kill all three of you. And just see what happens. None of this voting shit. I don't like him the way she looked at me. I want to vote her off the island. There's no voting in gladiatorial combat. <laughs> you got to make weapons out of freaking bamboo and, you know... I'm about to bust a gut, as we say in West Texas. Oh, you're over there in the part of Texas that New Mexico didn't want. UFC and Jiu Jitsu are gladiatorial. I want weapons and freaking armor. No. 
Tough to build dynasties in gladiatorial game. You got to win. W winner takes all. Winner takes all. I'm telling you, I want bread and circuses. <laughs> Look, it'll be a, it would be a lot less, if you think it's really over the top and graphic, it's a lot less than an episode of freaking The Boys. <laughs> I'm telling you. That show's out of control, man. That show is out of control. I'm never letting my, my daughter watch it. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> oh, man. No spoilers. No spoilers. I'm, I'm still in episode two of season, I guess, three. Oh, my God. You know those guys have a hell of a great time making a freaking show up. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then we'll do this, and then we'll do this other thing. Yeah. And then his head will explode, and then we'll show it. Yeah. You know those guys have a hell of a time making that stuff up. New Mexico can come and take it. Yeah, you even have a flag for that. New Mexico took it, yeah. Only because they outnumbered you, what? Well, they had a couple thousand guys, right? How many guys with the Alamo? A couple hundred? They were outnumbered at least 10 to 1, maybe 20 to 1. I need to start watching Stranger Things. Season 1 of Stranger Things is one of the best things I've seen on TV, probably ever. Um, I thought it was superb. And I'm like exactly the same age those kids are there in exactly that same year. So there's an appeal. There is an appeal to that. The latest episode got everything all wrong. People weren't wearing that stuff in 86. I remember 86 really well. Why don't they have senior leagues in the NFL? I want to see 75-year-old men knock the snot out of each other. The Silver Shields. The Silver Shield League. Can't wait to paint up some silver shields, man. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to do some successors, and I'm not making generic pipe bin units. There's going to be, we're going to get into the, we're going to get really deep, and we're going to, you know, these guys are going to be guys that I use for this successor. I, I may not have a chance to build all the successors, but if I decide to, like, build Demetrius, for instance, which seems like a really interesting guy regardless of how successful he was or wasn't um, you know I want to find out what his units are and make specific ones for him you know specific guys for you know humanese or what have you so rest of the show is awful yeah season one was really good because you were discovering things at the same time that the characters were discovering them. And it really made you think, like, okay, what? Oh, if this is here, then the other thing is here. And, you know, it's... I really liked it. I really, really liked it. Okay, we need, let's look at the finished one. Need more pure yellow, more pure yellow. Okay. Nah, I gotta work tomorrow, but I'm on a roll. My successor pike armies are pretty generic. Yeah, I'm not making mine generic. But I, I need to, you know, like some of the ones have like, 
Persian slingers or whatever, depending on whether it was whether he had one of the old school armies or he had one of the ones that was diluted by, you know, Persian influences. So I'm going to say, without going all the way through the book, there's people that I find interesting, and then there's people that I kind of take their light, their side. And I like the guys that didn't want the that wanted the Macedonians to stay Macedonian. So what's that make me like a Craterus fan? Craterus. Meliager, Antipater. Mm. Who else? Don't like the Ptolemies, even though I have a Ptolemaic army. Make yourself pharaoh. Cut the crap out. That's bullshit. Eumenes. <laughs> Eumenes was... I think Eumenes was, was on the conservative side. Doesn't matter. Build all of them. Or build many of them. All right. Um, we need to do the... Boy, this is... You can tell this thing is drying out like a mole. Uh, I guess I probably got to cut it. I probably have to cut it out. Damn it. I'm going to roll. Two hours. Two hours and I had a blast. So, something I heard today about Macedonians. Um, when the Argeads first took over, um, like Alexander's great, 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 whatever, and I forget which guy it is, they came, there's, there's some background information about um, you admire a guy who declares himself pharaoh and then has ability to keep that title and turn his rule. Into, you know, he was successful, but he wasn't a really he wasn't a really good general. So, you know, I'm interested in people that are good generals. Maybe we'll paint a successor from scratch. And I have a Ptolemaic army already, but you know, we're going to expand them into into 3.0 forever. Uh, the humor here is great. It is. That's what we're here for. So, one of uh, the one of the original Argeads that was the Macedonian, and I, and I want to look in the book to see how early the Macedonian list goes. Whoever he was, uses his standard, a goat, because there's some background information that originally the Macedonians came from goat herders. And I don't mean that to, to poo-poo them, just about everybody came from freaking goat herders of some kind or the other. Um, let me look at the Macedonian list and see how early it goes. It, it is a book one. It is a late book one list. Um, and let's see what that... I don't think they're earlier than like 500 BC. Um, I would honestly be surprised if they were 650 BC. So if you want to build a book one 54 early Macedonian list, you could use it with... Um, a goat banner. Might be a reason to do that. So what's this list consist of? Knight general, another knight, two spear or solid auxilia or fast auxilia, six fast auxilia and two soloi. And they can have allies, uh, what's 147? Thracians? No, Thracians are 48. 47 is Illyrians, okay. Or 5B. 5B is Athens, right? I've been late on. Interesting. 
Early Macedonian. Very interesting. Yeah, so I read about that today. On uh, well, it was read to me in the which one? Which Audible book am I reading right now? I can't check right now. It's a it's a Diadoki one as well. So anyhow, um, yeah. So, anyways, thanks for coming by, folks. We'll try to do this again tomorrow. I need to get some stuff knocked down since I'm not going to paint over the weekend but um, where's the finish shield this one and then the other ones are coming along so this is going to be the front rank of the eight bow stand and the rear rank we're going to have these four bowmen and it's going to be on a 40 by 40 stand like so so it's going to look like a cluster it's going to be uh, pretty cool so okay folks until next time, thanks for stopping by and having